it really means a lot for us for you to come in here uh, for this next uh, 45 minutes and be with us. Um, so I just wanted to start out um, with asking Sarah, you know, how did you first hear about this story? Well, I was too young in 1989 to have known about this case, um, and so I didn't learn about it until 2003. <clears throat> Excuse me, when I was uh, I was in college and I spent a summer working for a civil rights lawyer who was involved in the civil suit that's now ongoing uh, still. In 2003 it had not been filed yet and today it is almost 10 years old. Um, but I learned about the case then by working with these lawyers and I actually met Raymond and Kevin that summer. And I was just so outraged by the story and so interested in it was sort of fit with what I was studying and so I ended up writing my a senior essay in college about it, and then a couple years later decided that I wanted to know more about it and really tell the story. And so I wrote the book, um, and and pretty early on in that process, then we we decided, uh, you know, documentary filmmaking is the family business for me, <laughs> and so um, it it was so obvious that we had to make this film that this was such an important story and one that people really didn't know. They sort of People often think they know something about it. They've heard some of it, but the fact that the convictions were vacated in this case, we most people we talked to didn't know that, um, and so we felt it was really important just to, if nothing else, set the record straight about what happened here. Um, but I think there are also a lot of really important lessons to be learned from this story um, about false confessions, about this sort of rush to judgment that that came in the media. Um, and really for everyone that sort of bought this story that the police provided um, and really believed it. And so um, I think that those, the, trying to understand those forces are really um, important, not just for understanding this case, but for thinking about how this happens and why it happens and how we can prevent it from happening again. Corey, what did you think when Sarah came to you and said that she wanted to write the book? Well, she had called me, <clears throat> and uh, when she had called me, I didn't. I was just so caught up in my own little, my own little world. I didn't remember our conversation until she had reminded me, and uh, and I said, "Sure." What about you, Raymond? What was your first reaction? Um, well, basically, because I had met Sarah back in in '03, and and she had did the paper. Um, you know, through conversation and, and her knowledge, you know, of all the facts in the case, um, you know, and then going into the book, you know, uh, uh, we knew we had developed a friendship by that time. And so the trust was already there. And we knew that um, the book, you know, that the movie was going to be told right because Sarah knew all the facts. You know, she really did her research and we was really impressed, you know, with this, with this, with this, this young lady that just, you know, that took an interest and, and, you know, stood out, and she was willing to just like put her, you know, life kind of on hold, you know, to help us out, and that we was very grateful for that. Yeah. Now we're gonna um, see a, a clip in a, uh, just a few minutes um, that shows a little bit more about what happened, where the the film left off, um, when all of you boys were were picked up, boys at the time, 14 to 16 years old. Um, but Sarah, could you talk a little bit more? I mean, we set up the, the climate in New York at the right. time, but <clears throat> what was it like? I mean, what explains that this happened? Yeah, well, right, you, so, so far you've, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> still getting over cold. Yeah, thank you. Um, what you've seen here is basically just meeting the characters in our story. Um, these five men and also the city of New York, who's, which is a really important character, and I think you, you know, you see here it's very different than it is today. I don't know how many of you were living here in 89, um, but it was a very different city. Um, and so I think part of understanding the reaction to the case is understanding what was going on, these sort of um, incidents that had happened in the decade leading up to it that had sort of increased racial tension and made people very aware of this sort of us versus them thing that was happening in the city that this case really fit into. It was something that, um, you know, basically what, what happens, I'll, I guess, kind of catch you up just a little bit to, to the clip that we're going to see next. Um, this group of teenagers, <clears throat> including our five, go into the park this night in April 1989. Um, and some of them are arrested leaving the park. 
uh, because some people in this larger group had harassed and in some cases assaulted some joggers and bicyclists in the park. Um, and you know, not everyone in the group, and, um, but, the, but there were a few crimes that were committed there. And so some of these kids are picked up, and then a few hours later, the police discover a woman who had been jogging in the park who was found near death, who had been brutally raped and beaten. And I mean, it's a miracle that she survived. It was really a horrific crime. Um, and so they jumped to the conclusion that these kids who'd been in the park were responsible for this crime, and they began interrogating them with that assumption, certain that they were talking to the guilty parties um, and using sort of every tactic they had in their arsenal uh, to get confessions. And we'll see that clip in a moment, but just to reiterate, so you guys didn't know each other necessarily yeah. that night, did you, Raymond? Had you kind of seen the other four guys? or <coughs> No, I didn't know any of them um, that night, you know. Um, so that's why, you know, when you look back at the statements and, and how the whole case unraveled, you know, it's pretty easy to see how that can happen, you know, when, especially when you don't know him. You know, like in, in Corey's instance, mm -hmm. he knew Yusuf, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, and so they were, they were really good friends. And, and, you know, you'll see the clip. Well, I don't know if you guys will see the clip in the movie, but if you get to see the movie, you know, it tells you how the police stopped Yusuf and, and, and they, they have his name on a list, but Corey's name isn't on a list, you know, and, um, and because their friendship was so strong, you know, the police said, well, just come with him and, you know, you'll be back. And he wanted to come back 13 years later, you know, so. There's these four different confessions that are totally mismatching. Yeah. How, does, how does it end <clears throat> up that they end up in prison? Right, I mean, ultimately, this is just sort of a, a portion of what happens in the interrogations. Um, later, they pick up Corey and Youssef um, and interrogate them. And ultimately, four of the five that we're getting to know give these videotape statements. Um, which end up being this really powerful piece of evidence. You know, there are these sort of rehearsed things. They've already given written statements. The police have sort of fed all of the information, and they, they give these statements, and, and that's what gets presented to the jury. And it's very convincing. It's hard for people to understand why someone would falsely confess. And so it was really important to us in the film to really try to understand, and these guys explain it so well, try to understand how that could happen. because. You know, the jury looked at that and believed it, even though, as Tia said, the details were wrong. You know, Antron talks about describing a different person than what he was wearing. That's not what the jogger was wearing. They get, I mean, the location of the attack, what, everything is wrong. And, and the amazing thing is that people so wanted to believe this story. The police wanted to believe it. They wanted to have the right guys. And they shared this with the media as if it were fact. And people just bought it. And so later on, they start getting forensic evidence back. DNA tests are negative. Uh, there's no blood anywhere in this incredibly bloody crime scene. There's no blood anywhere on any of these guys. Um, and they just plow ahead um, with really terrifying consequences. Yeah. I mean, Raymond, during the trial, you must have been thinking, like, there's no way that this is going to happen, right? Like, well, you know, uh, basically, because we were still young, it kind of goes over your head. The whole scene, you're kind of numb to it. And, um, and there was a, a, a part during trial where the lawyers took us in the back and they said, you know, uh, we, we, we're looking to get a plea deal, you know, because we're going to lose this case, you know. And, um, and so they wanted to negotiate a plea deal, and, but it had to be all three of us, which is me, Yusuf, and, and Antron. And, um, and, uh, and we looked at each other and we was like, nah, we're not taking a plea deal. You know, we didn't do it. And so, you know, and, and Yusuf, I remember Yusuf was, was, and at that point I had, uh, I had over a year and a half incarcerated. And so I would have benefited, you know, if I would have took a plea deal. But I remember Yusuf was really like gun ho and he stuck to his guns and he was like, no, you know, they can give me a life, you know, my life in a day and, and, and I'm just gonna do it, but I'm not gonna cop out to something that we didn't do. And, and we was like, yeah, you're right, and we stuck to it. Yeah. And then you two, Corey and Raymond, end up spending seven to 13 years in, in prison. Uh, did the Rikers Island thing. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, for about, what, two years. And uh, uh, this, mainly this that, just going back and forth to court, learning, learning, uh, just learning whatever I could learn about about myself in the case. You know? 
Yeah, and I, you talk a lot in the film about having to grow up, and that's no way to grow up, but being, you know, boys in there amongst other men. No. Um, so if you, you know, of course, and I want to make sure we get a chance to take questions, but, you know, fast forward in the film, and, and you heard the voice of Matias Reyes at the beginning confessing to the crime. Um, Corey, you actually ended up having two encounters with him mm. when you were in prison. Could you tell us about that? Oh, uh, boy, boy, boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My boy Destiny. Mm -hmm. That's what he was, Destiny. Uh, uh, good day, New York, and have a great one. Uh, Destiny. I had every, when I was on the streets, when I was on the streets as a kid, I watched uh, a program called Video Music Box with Ralph McDaniels, who do hip hop and R&B. So I was very into that. You know, that's the only thing that's good for the, for the neighborhood. So I brought it with me to Rikers Island. Unexpectedly, but I brought it with me. That, just the mind, mind state of video music box. Uh, I, came, I became a porter there, lived in a box, in a box. It's, the box is called 20, 23 Hour lock -in. Uh So the officers, uh, for, for my two years I was there, when they, got, when they got to work about 10 to 3, they let me out my cell. So every time I came out my cell, I thanked them for doing it because they didn't have to. So came out, cleaned up, and, and fed the key blockers. And uh, it was also called CFC housing, Simpson monitor case. And I had a, quite a few, a few people down there with me. So uh, came out. I had went to the day room door, opened it up, and I had holler at the bubble where the officers at so they cut the television on. So they did that. So I had turned on the channel of video, video music box, but it didn't come on yet. It was about a good five minutes before it came on. So I did that, turned it up a little bit, and get, you know, get the, the cleaning, cleaning stuff ready to clean up before dinner come in. Uh, so as I'm doing my cleaning, I'm hearing doors open up, cells over my head open up. So three o'clock then came in, and I'm hearing video music about going on in the day room. So in the two end gates for the north and south opens up, because some of my CFC uh, colleagues was on the other side on their way to my side, to the day room. So, I didn't hear the music no more. Whether I don't know whether I was I wasn't paying attention to it or not, but I hear the music, so I stopped what I was doing, and I went on to the day room. And when I got to the day room door, my destiny was standing in front of the television. And that was that was Matias Reyes. Right. It was another. And I just told him, I said, "Excuse me, can you?" Put it back on the channel that, that was there. He said, I'm not watching that. So I said, I was, but you, you but you doing something. Don't worry about what I'm doing. Just put it back, just relax. And we just, long story short, we went to blows. And so after we went to blows, uh, yeah. I guess. But when I saw him, yeah, about a year or two ago. Yeah, so then about, what, In 10 years later, 13, you end up, yeah. 13 yeah, years later, yeah. you end up seeing him again. Well, I saw him, and when I saw him, he was playing stickball. So he was in, and I guess when he, did, when he did come see me, I guess word got back to him, I don't know. But when he did see me, he just said, uh, hey, Wise, I was on the basketball court just waiting on the, waiting on or, or, Auburn's doors to open up because we all just came out of the programming. There's about five, a thousand of us out in the yard. And when he called me, I looked at him. I said, you're wise. I said, hey, what's up? So you wise? I said, yeah, you got mail for me? <laughs> he said, no, uh, I'd like to apologize to you. He had his own intentions, but I said, apologize to me for what? No, because we had a fight over television. Oh. Don't worry about it. We here. Don't worry about it. It's not going to do nothing with me. Don't worry about it. 
know, you always maintain, you know. But, but I know he was going to be my, the destiny to this. Yeah. So shortly soon, after that, yeah, he soon ends after up confessing. He apologized to Corey about that incident. He started um, asking around and talking to people in the prison and ultimately confessed that he had raped the Central Park jogger and that he had done it alone. And that began an exhaustive investigation by the district attorney's office um, into his story, and they tested his DNA, and it matched the single sample of DNA that had been present uh, at the crime scene from the beginning um, that had, of course, matched none of the five, um, and it matched Reyes. And they checked out his story, and it fit the details of the crime in a way that these statements taken within days had not. Um, and so ultimately, the district attorney's office joined in a motion to vacate the convictions, which happened in 2002. Raymond, what was it like when, uh, how did you find out that the convictions had been vacated? Well, I was, uh, I was serving a three and a half to seven year sentence at Franklin Correctional Facility um, for possession with the intent to distribute. And, um, and they, 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 they brought me back down to downstate, which is, which is, uh, uh, is uh, the indoctrination into the Department of Corrections. And so it was there that uh, they, they brought me in and they, I didn't know it was officers at first, and they was trying to conduct an interview with me, and, and their line was that, uh, their reason was that um, they wanted to change juvenile laws. So they looked at our case and they just wanted some information. But they kept asking about Patricia Molly. And so, you know, I kept asking why, and they wouldn't tell me, but so, you know, we went on with the, with the, uh, with the meeting, and, and then afterwards I wound up calling my dad. And I said, you know, they brought me back down here and, and um, asked about the case. But at that point, he had known already. You know, the, the information got to him, but I didn't know. And so he says, well, you know, sit down. I got something to tell you. And I'm like, well, what do you got to tell me? And he's like, just sit down. And I'm like, well, what? What is it? You know, I gotta, <laughs> we got six minutes on this phone. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and he goes, well, you know, uh, they found a guy that did your case. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And he says, yeah, they found a guy that did your case. You're going to be coming home soon. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, go into, so what happens is um, I didn't believe him. You know, I was like, what? Get out. And I, and I said, you know what, I'll talk to you later. And I really hung up, I hung up on him. <laughs> you know, I hung up on him. And then and I went back to my cell and I thought about it and I was like, well, did they really find this dude? You know, and it's been so long. And, and, and I was really doubtful and I thought that they would just try to make him the sixth man and then just try to sweep it under the rug. Mm. You know, and, and, and I was in denial, you know, all the way until like almost my release. Yeah. And not only had Matias Reyes raped other women and beat them before the night that you see in the film, um, but having gone free, he went on to do that in yeah. the weeks after too. Yeah, they also, um, they also to add on to, to what you just uh, said, um, uh, they didn't, when he went and, and, and went to the, uh, con, uh, when he went and confessed to the uh, district attorney's office during the investigation, they didn't believe him. And so what he did was he wanted to solve like four unsolved cases. And then that's when he took him serious. Right. He had been arrested in, later in 1989 and eventually pled guilty to a series of rapes, including a rape murder um, that he committed unrelated to this case that he had committed through that same summer. And so he was serving a life sentence um, starting at that, around that same time. But, you know, the fact that they had overlooked this evidence that was there, that existed even in those days, um, that he was responsible for the Central Park jogger rape um, not only meant that these guys spent many years in prison for something they didn't do, um, but also that Reyes was left on the street to commit these other crimes that he was eventually convicted of. Yeah. So I want to see if anybody in the audience wants to ask any questions, and I'll probably just repeat it so that that can be heard. Don't all raise your hand at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. They had the question is, did you have any attorneys during questioning, like when you were being interrogated when they first picked you up? No. No. <laughs> um, basically, uh, uh, you know, at that point, because we were so young, you know, a lot of that goes over your head. You know, you don't know what Miranda rights are. You don't know to say, hold on, I need an attorney. All you're saying is, where's my dad? Where's my mom? That's the first person you're looking for. And, and, and even when they come, you know, the police have a way of, maneuvering around that, which you'll see in the film, mm. you know. So if they want you that bad, 
they're going to do everything they have to. Yeah, and you talked about in the film, Sarah, the immense pressure to make sure that someone was brought to justice. Sure, I mean, they. I think the police knew right away that this was going to be a big story, um, that it happened in Central Park and the sort of nature of the crime. I think there was, this is, you know, an immediate understanding that this was a case that they were going to be under a lot of pressure to solve quickly, and they were, you know, determined to do that. They had this idea, and they just... They went with it, and they used they used all their tricks, um, and you know the the power dynamic in an interrogation room between you know seasoned homicide detectives with 20 years of experience and a 14, 15, or 16 year old um, is pretty extraordinary. Um, they were all get read their Miranda rights, but you know people don't understand what that means. And this is sort of before the days of law and order even, right, when everyone is kind of familiar <laughs> with these rituals. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't know what that means when you're a kid and you don't have the support and the police are telling you that you're not really in trouble, we just need to ask you a few questions. And they have these ways of sort of glossing over this stuff um, and, and keeping the parents at bay and sort of keeping everyone in the dark about what's what their intentions really are. And you know, the interesting thing is that there were a large group of kids who'd gone to the park that night, and most of them at some point over these couple of days were brought in and interrogated. And you know, some of those kids had records or had been in trouble before, or some of them had parents who, you know, someone's parents worked in corrections and sort of knew a little bit more about the system. And so those were the kids who said, I want a lawyer, or I'm not gonna say anything. Um, and so ultimately, you know, people sometimes ask me, well, why did the police target these five? out of all these kids. It's like they targeted everyone. And I think that these guys were, um, in some ways, because of their innocence, the most vulnerable. They were the ones who hadn't been arrested, who hadn't been in trouble, who didn't know how to navigate the system. And their parents um, and guardians, to the extent that they were there, didn't know that either, didn't have experience with that, and didn't know what to do or how to help them. Other questions? Yeah, over here. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, given that you were so young when you were uh, when you were arrested, um, you weren't finished school by that time. Have you been able to finish school since? And also, when you were in prison, was there any attempt to uh, to give you the schooling that you were missing by by not being on the outside? Yeah. Um. You know, I wasn't going to the ninth grade at that time. Um. And so. Uh, uh, I was in eighth grade, and um, I wound up doing uh, the rest of the eighth grade in Spofford. And, and then and I remember um, Spofford, I mean, I'm sorry, my, my junior high school graduated me to high school. And so uh, I was in junior Richmond. I, my father was receiving cut cards, and I was in prison. And so, <laughs> yeah, and so, and so when I reached, after I was convicted, and I reached uh, Goshen Secure Center, there was a program that I was able to get my GED and I was able to go to college and get an associate's degree before uh, Pataki cut the program. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. What about you? you just, oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, you got a GED, right? right? Yeah. Right, at, right, right, right before I got kidnapped, I got it in, uh, in, St in Stevenson High School in the Bronx. Mm. And then later on, as I went through, they, they still try to make me do the whole high school thing again because they have, well, when you transition like that, they, you have to start brand new. So uh, shortly after that, I found myself trying to do the college before Pataki took it out. Yeah, and they ended up stopping the, yeah. right. the education yeah, they program. They cut funding for the program that made that possible. And one, one more question. Uh, what do you want the audience to take away from well, we, we actually just screened last, had a really amazing screening last night um, as part of the Doc NYC Film Festival, uh, where we had all five of the Central Park Five together on stage um, and, and together in the same place for the first time since they were arraigned in 1989, yeah. um, which was a pretty uh, amazing experience. I know it was for me. <laughs> I think it was for the audience, too. And we've, yeah. you know, we've really been having a, a, a great experience showing it to some audiences and having um, I mean, you guys can talk about a little bit about what that, what that feels like for you to get that kind of response that you have. But as far as what, what I would hope people take away from it, um, as I said before, part of this is about just informing people. This is what happened. Um, but we, we always made this 
film not as a whodunit. This wasn't a question. We, we learned about this case knowing that these guys were innocent, um, but as a how did this happen? And, and so I think understanding the ways that this happened and the sort of mechanisms by which something, a miscarriage of justice like this happens, um, is a really important sort of first step and hopefully the beginning of a conversation about how do we fix those things and how do we prevent this from happening again? Because I think that despite the fact that New York is very different now than it was then, I think that not enough has changed and certainly something like this, I believe, could happen again. Um, the interrogation tactics are exactly the same. Um, and, and there's still, to this day, no sense among the NYPD that they even did anything wrong or even that they got this wrong. Um, they've resisted even the idea that the convictions should have been vacated. Yeah. yeah. So obviously we still need to be talking about this. Yeah. Corey and Raymond, what, what has it been like having to relive and retell this story? Is, is bumping into my destiny it was is really is really still beyond me. I'm still walking on clouds right now. <laughs> because uh, you know, real talk. Uh I have no I have no 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 animosity towards my, my brothers, but they was far from a mile on Rikers Island. I just I just responded. I just responded and uh and as of now, you know, I'm glad that uh, I'm alive. Well, as my brother Raymond and the, and the rest of the guys, Kevin, Yusuf, McCray, I'm glad we're all alive to tell our own individual stories. Okay. And so the world, who's been hearing so much of the nasty of it, they can finally see it and they can put things to rest. Yeah. yeah. Raymond? Yeah. For me, um, for me, basically, um, back in 1989, you know, we were 14, 15, and 16 year olds, and and when this when the story happened, you know, and we were taken away, our voices were, were were gone also through the whole process. So you never got to hear Raymond, you know, Corey, and you know the rest of the guy's story. All you got to read was what the media put together, the interviews that they conducted in our neighborhoods, and and how they dissected our lives. But you never got to hear us, and then. We were also replaced with, you know, wilding, you know, uh, urban terrorists, rapists, you know, uh, wolf pack. And so that became, you know, what was associated with us. The Central Park Five label was something really negative. And so what this movie does for us, you know, is restore us and gives us back our voices. And, and, um, and what you guys do for us is when you watch this movie and you respond, you know, and you engage in conversation with us and, and you talk about how you feel and how it makes you outraged. And that's part of the healing process for us, you know, to see the response that we get from you guys now. Because in 89, there was, you know, there was nothing but negative responses. And now, you know, in 2012, it's nothing but positive. And so it helps us a great deal. And um, what, we want you, what we want you guys to, to wait from the movie is also that um, we're not animals, that we are human beings and we was kids. and, and and, uh, and we want you to in, 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 uh, indulge in discussions with other people, like Sarah said, and, and, and find ways of how we can put this to rest. Yeah, there is. Yeah, go ahead, Corey. As a, as a hip hop fan, the word wild day that I'm hearing so much about, it came from a hip hop artist by the name of Tone Loke from out of the West Coast. He had, a, he had an old song called Wild Day. And then they went from they went, they went from there to commercials and they started talking about food. But when I was in Central Bookings, I was hearing. I don't know where I was hearing it from, but I was hearing wild thing, they was I was hearing it. So when I was hearing it, and later on, it was it was picked up and it put it made a negative out of it. It wasn't supposed to be a negative out of it, but it was, it was picked up media. They made a, a negative. They was out there wilding. So you know, yeah. so yeah. that's that's about it. That's yeah. yeah, and I know that you know there's nothing that can give back to, you know, to to give back what you were taken away. But <sighs> if if people do want to help. Um, there is an ongoing case. It's now been nine years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a civil suit against the city. 
And um, I know that you guys can't talk about it too much, but hearing upcoming on December 17th, and if you are moved by this, you can write letters to Mayor Bloomberg and others um, to you know, let them know that we all know the truth yeah. about what happened. Yeah, it's all about the numbers at the end of the day. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what they respect, how the people come out, how you support, how you react, you know, what's your feedback. You know, we have a Facebook page, the Central mm -hmm. Park Five, that, that is growing daily. You know, we're always on Facebook and Twitter, you know, trying to put the word out. You know, so we encourage you guys to come on out and stand with us. Every month that I find myself in this federal building without my, without my co-workers with me, <laughs> co-defendants with me, the city loves it. They love, they love not saying no media or, pe or supporters. They love it. Mm -hmm. They love it. They love it. And recently, it, when people been coming out, the city's been getting nervous. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> and when I, for the first time, when I, when I saw the judge, when he came out from his chambers to the courtroom, yeah. and he saw he had to take a double take. He damn near caught a heart attack because he didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah. He said, what, 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 I missed something here. Yeah. What, what, what's yeah. happening? I bet. Yeah. So it, was, it helps. Yeah. And like I said, you know, with it, I pray, as a spiritual person, I prayed it within myself for something like that to come about because it was just eating me up alive for so long, coming up in there, there's no rhythm going on up there. It's just, ah, they just drag it. They say you just drag it. Mm -hmm. Talking about nothing, they just drag it. Nothing. Yeah. Well, thank you for, mm -hmm. for telling your story in the film and the book and being here. I'm sure it's really difficult, but we really appreciate it. And thank you, Sarah. And she made the film with uh, her husband, Dave, and her father, Ken. Thanks to you all for making the story happen.